to their announcements uh, the last few weeks. So I, if they have announced it, I didn't hear it. And uh, I haven't really been talking with some of the folks that, that I know up in that church. I haven't talked with them in a while. So I, I don't know. They might be having something. But if you can go to one of those services and uh, they're not sickly or anything, you don't think you pick anything up, then, then help yourself. I, I think it'd be good for us. But um, my wife and I this year, we're going to have to bail out on the watch night service. I, I've just got too much. Uh, too much. I, I, I mean, you've already got Sunday morning service on, on New Year's Day the next day. That's tough, staying up to midnight praying in the New Year's and then driving home and getting up early the next morning for your church services. That's going to be tough on us, so uh, we're probably going to bail out this year. But if you can go, uh, help yourself, that'd be wonderful. All right, Brother Jim's going to come lead us in our last song. Praise Him, praise Him. That's on 19, page 19, as we stand. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him. Jesus the crucified, sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness, praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, heavenly Portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigning forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sister Linda, for the good playing tonight. Thank you, Brother Jim. A wonderful selection of songs tonight. And uh, you did a, did a great job uh, leading the music. And Sister Linda did a great job playing the music. And I certainly do appreciate that. And then our folks did a great job singing the songs. I appreciate all that. God's honored in our praise, whether it's through voice of singing or whether it's just through our, our uplifted hands. God's honored in that. And, and I certainly do appreciate your faithfulness to honor God and your praise. And, and I know that God uh, certainly does appreciate our heartfelt praise. Revelation chapter 6, if you would, in your Bibles. I saw Sister Jean and Brother Paul come in. Uh, they come in just a little while ago, and I'm glad to see her doing a little better. We had just prayed for her that the Lord might help her. I know she would not felt good this morning, and she had been sick this week, the whole week. But uh, glad the Lord helped her be able to be at the house of the Lord tonight. And, and certainly do appreciate your prayers for her. And... Uh, and I'm glad she's feeling better. Revelation chapter 6. We're going to begin reading verse number 5, read through verse number 8, and then we'll get right back off where we left off on Wednesday night in our study and continue on a little further. We're on this third seal now, and uh, we, we, uh, we've already finished the first two seals. We're on the third seal. The thing to keep in mind about these, uh, these first four seals here 
is that we, for every indicator we have, these things are going to come in quick succession, succession. They will not happen at the exact same time, but they may just be a, a, a few hours or a few minutes or, or a day, a few days apart from, from hitting. They're going to come in most likely very quickly early in the opening of the tribulation, uh, the seven years of tribulation, and they're going to happen in succession. Um, and it's, it's probably going to knock this world off their feet somewhat, but that's going to empower the Antichrist to really rise up more and take more power in the midst of all that. Um, but we, we've dealt with the first two, discussed them. Now we're on the third seal tonight. And I've already dealt with this partly on Wednesday. We'll go back and do a little review, and then uh, we'll, we'll get into new material. Revelation chapter 6, verse number 5. When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Now, we left off on Wednesday night teaching on this third seal, which when the, the Lord opens, when the Lamb opens it, is going to reveal a black horse and a rider holding a pair of balances in his hand. As we discussed in the last lesson, this horse and rider represents famine. It represents famine during the tribulation. Now, we know that in the last days there will be a famine of hearing of the word of God. We know this. Amos chapter number 8 and verse number 11. In Amos 8, 11, the Bible says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So we know that the Bible is prophesied that there's going to be a famine in the land, and that's picturing in the last days. That's a point, that's a point that God is trying to target out in the, in the minor prophets of those last days. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 2, the Bible says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. In other words, the Bible's saying you're going to have on, on one, uh, 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 just give you a picture, on one street corner, you, you've got a gentleman out here preaching truth and preaching the unadulterated word of God, the holy word of God. And he's proclaiming truth. And on another street corner, you're going to have some individual that's just preaching fables. That's giving them some kind of prosperity idea or just some kind of fable they're, they're proclaiming out there. And the crowd gets to choose which one. They're going to all go for the fable. In this day, the day that Paul's addressing P, uh, Timothy with, in that day, they're going to follow the fables and they're going to turn their backs on the truth. Now, I don't know if we're in that day, but we're real close if we're not. We're living in a day where people absolutely are flying in the face of God when it comes to truth. And yet they'll accept the fable. Something that the Word of God clearly denies, uh, they'll accept that and they'll reject the truth. I was listening, just, just politically speaking this week, I was listening where two states had made some rulings. One of them had ruled that public prayer um, is, is, is not allowed that it's just too biased against other individuals. So public prayer to God Almighty, the Christian God, is not going to be allowed according to this, this particular state and this leader in this state. And then another state had, had ruled by, by, by open vote, had, had ruled that uh, they had decided in the legislature, they had decided that uh, they're going to allow this perversion of letting men compete against women in sports because they feel like a woman. So they're going to allow that. Now you're talking about being descriptive of what Paul was talking to Timothy about, that's an example of it. Absolutely ignoring the truth of the Bible. Absolutely ignoring truth and even common sense. Going to go fall for fables. If we're not living in that day, we are so close we can't tell the difference. I'm telling you, we're real close to being in that day. But that's what he said. They're going to turn. They're going to turn in that day. 
Uh, after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So Amos 8.11 says there's going to be a famine in the hearing. But according to verse number 12 in the book of Amos chapter 8, there will also be a famine of sound preaching in the last days. And they shall wander from sea to, sh from sea, to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. They're going to run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and they won't be able to find it. They won't be able to find it. They're going to want someone to preach truth to them and they're not going to be able to find it. God's anointing, it, it, that's what it's referencing there. God's anointing at that time is not going to be, it's not going to be available to them. Now in Micah chapter number 3, the book of Micah chapter number 3, and verse number 5, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace. He that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Therefore night shall be unto you that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you that ye shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. In that day, there is no answer of God. In Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 7, verse number 25. Ezekiel chapter 7, and verse number 25. The Bible said, Destruction cometh. They shall seek peace, and there shall be none. Now, this is picturing the tribulation in the last days. Destruction cometh, they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. You think of Matthew 24 there. there shall, uh, then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. They're, they're going to seek a vision from the prophet. What's going on here, prophet? What's going on here, priest? What's, what's happening here? But the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. The Bible said in Ezekiel chapter number 7, there's going to be a famine of the word of God. In the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms chapter number uh, 74, verse number 1. O God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion wherein thou hast dwelt. Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. So the enemies invaded the house of God, the worship place. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their ensigns, for signs, I'll jump over to verse number 7. They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. Does that not sound like this radical leftist group attacking these Jewish synagogues and Christian churches? It sounds just like it. Verse 9. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet. Neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. How long? Nobody seems to have answers to our questions. Lord, how long? This again is picturing the tribulation in the last days. Lord, how long? How long? That's the picture there. The passage is testifying to the land of Israel. But could this be true of the New Testament church as well? Do we, do we think that it's possible that these days can get so dark that even in America, the wicked could turn on the house of God and the, the churches and the worship centers and, and begin to burn them to the ground, put fire in their sanctuaries and, and, uh, and, and, and persecution be heavy upon us. I think the day's on us. We're not living in that right now. We're not going through that, thank the Lord. But I think the day's upon us. It's in the heart of the wicked to do it right now. They, they feel a freedom in this country right now to persecute Jews and Christians. They feel a freedom to do it. They have not unleashed it as of yet. They're uncertain about the few politicians that are still trying to protect uh, our Christian faith. They're uncertain about that. But if it wasn't for that, I think they'd unleash on us already. 
Is it possible that these things could happen to the New Testament church in our day or in the last days? It's possible. I don't know that it will, but it is possible. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse number 2. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse number 2. Then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are, are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. I'm going to read that again because he's talking to Ezekiel here and he says, the elders of Israel, the leaders of Israel are going to come to me and ask to, to, that I might have ear. I might lend ear to them and I'm not going to lend ear. That's what he's saying. Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. God has turned from them. God had dealt with the people of Israel, and God had dealt with the people of Israel, and God had dealt with the people of Israel, and they ignored, and they ignored, and they would not heed his word. And finally, God said, that's it. Now I'm not going to listen to you. You can cry all you want, but now I'm not going to listen to you. Uh, and that, that was the case. God stopped listening to their cries. Could God be doing the very same thing in America? There are a lot of preachers that think he is. I, I don't doubt that he could, if it be his will. I, I know God has not turned his back on us, or we'd be in a whole lot worse shape than what we already are, are in. Uh, but I do believe the hand of God is slowly moving off our nation. I, I, think, I think you can see that the hand of God is slowly pulling back uh, where he once blessed us greatly. Psalm chapter 9, verse number 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God... That's in the Bible. That's holy word of God. That's holy writ. That's what God said. The wicked shall be turned into hell. All the nations that forget God. But wait a minute, preacher. This is America. The greatest nation on the face of the earth. You have to just drop down three verses from that verse 17 I just read. Read that verse. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. When you get right down to it, America is just another nation of men. The thing that set us apart, beloved, wasn't what we were, but the thing that set us apart is that we used to fear God. We used to honor God, and it was God that set us apart. It wasn't we ourselves. And once we kicked God out of everything, and we did it a long time ago, we're still doing it. Once we began to kick God out of everything, we presented ourselves honestly to the whole world. We're just nothing but a nation of men, just like any other nation. We're no better than anybody else. There's a mentality in our nation, and it has been here for quite a while, and it's a mentality of pride that somehow because we are America, that we've been set apart. We're something special just being Americans. And we don't understand the thing that made us special wasn't us being Americans. The thing that made us special was that we honored God. We feared God as a nation at one time. We feared God. I think we're far away from that now. I do believe there are people still here that fear God or else the, the hand of God would be completely removed and the hand of Satan would just start to crush us. I, I do believe that there are still people that honor God. There are still churches that are doing right and living right and Christians that are doing right and living right. But as far as a nation, especially our leadership, it's been a long time since we've tried to follow God in the right way, biblically. We quit doing that. We stopped doing that. And once we stopped doing that, we're one of those nations that forgot God. And God said, they're going to be turned into hell. That's what he said. That was a promise from the word of God. So we're, near, we're no different than anybody else. No different than anybody else. First Timothy, chapter number 4, verse number 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Um, the famine of hearing in the last days is what this is referring to. This is what these passages are talking to. But according to this text here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, religion is going to be obvious and prevalent in the last days. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed. Okay, they're going to depart from the truth. They're going to depart from the faith and from the truth, but they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Doctrines tells me that's a religious view. Doctrines of devil, that's, devils, that's involved in some kind of religion. So religion's going to be obvious and prevalent in the last days, but honoring God and the truth will not. 
But the religion will be there, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That religion is going to be around. But there's a famine of the truth. There is a famine of the truth. And, I, and I'm not so sure we're not already in those days. I think we are. And I, I can't prove it to you. We, listen, we could go another thousand years. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, biblically, as far as prophecy, we could go another thousand years. There's no obligation to God to have to come soon other than the fact that he said he's coming soon. And uh, that's in God's timing, not in our timing. Um, he could go another thousand years. But from every indicator we have, and he did give us some indicators. From every indicator, he specifically gave the Jews, but we know those things very well may apply to our day right before the rapture of the church. I think we're in the last hours, last minutes of the last hour. I think we're near. I think we're real near. Because there's a famine of preaching and hearing in the last days, it appears that there will be probably a famine in the number of souls saved then as well. Look at Luke chapter 17, if you would. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 17, verse number 26. I preached on this passage probably about five, six months ago. Luke 17, 26 and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and, listen now, and destroyed them all. Okay, so in the days of Noah, he ended up with God destroying them all. Verse 28, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. Listen now, and destroyed them all. Again, in the days of Noah, it ended up with the destruction of all of them. And in the days of Lot, it ended up with the destruction of all of them, except the ones that God saved. He said in the last days, it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. That's what he said. As, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Okay? How many souls were saved in the days of Noah? By the ark, eight souls, just eight souls, Noah and his family. And the Bible clarifies that all the rest were destroyed and destroyed them all. If you weren't on that, that ark, if you weren't on that boat, if you weren't one of those eight, you were destroyed. So only eight souls were saved. How many souls were saved in the days of Lot? Three. Lot and his two daughters. Remember his wife turned back and looked, she turned to a pillar of salt. Three of them, three were saved. So you had eight saved in the days of Noah. You had three saved in the days of Lot. When you compare that with their populations back then, that wasn't a whole lot. Wasn't a whole lot of folks saved. So if it was as it was in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, that gives me indicator why we're not seeing a whole lot of folks saved today. It just may be the way God's already said. I mean, it's not that God won't save them. They don't want to be saved. It's not that there's a problem with God or his saving nature or anything to do with that. It's that they don't want what God's offering in the last days. They're not going to want it. And that certainly seems to picture our day. We're not seeing the crowds come to Jesus today. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. We're not seeing the crowds come to Jesus. Dr. Seitler, he had that, that revival in Pelham, North Carolina. That's where Tabernacle got started from. He had that revival. He was pastoring he, when he, at first. He was part-time pastor at First Baptist Church of Pelham and part-time pastor at First Baptist Church of Malden. Uh, after about six or eight months, uh, maybe close to a year, he decided to tell Malden, I can't do it. God's doing something over here in Pelham. I can't stay over here. can't swap back and forth. So he went completely over Pelham. Within just a few years there, God started sending revival. They started having prayer meetings once a week outside on the grounds. And cars would pull in under conviction and go out there and get saved. Just pull in, see him out there praying, and didn't even know him. But get saved. God started sending revival through all that, that working and all that. What led him to have those prayer meetings was that when he was first there, every month for over a year, every month somebody was getting saved. Most of the time, every week, an individual was coming and getting saved. Every week. And then he had went two months, and nobody had gotten saved. And it so broke his heart that nobody was getting saved that they, he said, let's start meeting once a week at least. We're going to meet on a regular church service, but we're going to come out here on a Thursday evening. We're going to meet and pray on the grounds because I'm, I'm under the burden. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why God's not saving anybody. It burned him that much. We wouldn't know what to do if God started saving people every week. I mean, I, I mean it would be a great blessing, but we haven't seen it. Not many churches at all 
have seen it. We're not unusual in that. Not many churches have seen that, where people are saved every week on the week. Now, there are some bigger works, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of evangelistic meeting, uh, workings out of those works, and they're seeing people led to the Lord, and I thank God for that. But the average churches, we're not seeing people every day or every week come to the Lord. That would be wonderful if we did, but we're not seeing that. There's a difference in our day, and in the days gone by, in the days of revival, we're not seeing that. Is it possible that God had already prophesied of this day when he said, as it was in the days of Noah? as it was in the days of Lot. Because we know not many souls got saved in the days of Noah, just eight. We know not many souls got saved in the days of Lot, just three. Maybe that's the day we're living in. Maybe it is. Now, God's not the problem there. I promise you, God's not the problem there. It is, it is two things. Number one, the world's not wanting the message God's trying to deliver to them. And number two, the church isn't in the condition we need to be in to deliver that message. Our hearts aren't close to God like it should be. Our hearts aren't knitted with God as it should be. We're cold and indifferent, and apathetic, unburdened. And we're not able to reach them because we don't have a, a, much of a compassion or burden for them. And part of that falls on us. But he prophesied. He said, as it is, as it is, it, that very well may be going on in our day. So we know that in the last days there will be a famine of both the preaching truth, preaching of truth, and there will be a famine of hearing. We know that. That's what Amos was talking about. But that's not what the third seal represents. The third seal over in Revelation chapter 6 represents a literal economic and agricultural famine. It's a literal famine he's picturing. He's, uh, th this horse that's pictured here is a black horse. And as I, I, I went over this on Wednesday night, I'll, I'll go over it again because a lot of our folks weren't here uh, on Wednesday night and th that are here now. But black in the Bible signifies famine. In the book of Lamentations, Lamentations and uh, chapter number 4. Book of Lamentations, chapter 4, God shows us um, that black is a picture uh, of famine. It's representing famine. Let me find my place here. Lamentations, chapter 4, and verse number 4. All right, the Bible says this. Um, no, I'm still in the wrong place. I mean, Jeremiah. All right, Lamentations, Lamentations chapter 4, verse number 4. The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread, and no man breaketh it unto them. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. That was overthrown as in a moment, and no hands stayed on her. I'll jump down to verse number 8. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They're not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away, stricken through for want of the fruits of the field. They're going through a drought. They're going through a famine. And that's what the Bible's picturing there. In verse number 8, he says their visage is blacker than a coal. It's a picture of famine. In the next chapter, over in Lamentations chapter 5, verse number 9, we get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. See, black represents famine. Black signifies Famine. Black also pictures lamentation and mourning in uh, Jeremiah chapter 4. That's where I turned a while ago. But Jeremiah chapter 4, verse number 27. Jeremiah 4, 27. The Bible said, For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, um, and the heavens above be black. Because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. So the Bible, God's talking about the land being desolate, and, and they are in lamentation and mourning over the land being desolate. Verse 28, he says, For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black. 
at picturing the mourning and the lamentation. So black is a picture of famine, and black is a picture of mourning and lamentation. The mourning and lamentation comes about because the judgment of God's falling in Revelation chapter 6. That's the third seal that's open. That's the judgment of God. That's the mourning and lamentation. But it also pictures the famine. He clarifies it by talking about the balances in Revelation chapter 6, those balances. Uh, they had a pair, uh, he, the, the rider of that black horse in Revelation 6 5 had a pair of balances in his hand. Balances are used to weigh things of precious value. You take scales, that's what it's talking about, scales. You take scales, you take balances, and you weigh the weight of gold or gold dust. You weigh the weight of silver. You weigh precious things by ounces and by pounds sometimes, but primarily scales and balances are used for ounces to weigh those intricate ounces. But sometimes, sometimes, you even, uh, those balances are used to, to weigh um, judgment uh, in Daniel. Daniel chapter number 5 and verse number 25. We have this story here where um, we've got the king that has mocked God and brought the vessels um, that Nebuchadnezzar had captured. He brought those vessels in there and began to, Belshazzar began to drink out of them, a party out of them, and then the hand of God came out of the wall and started writing on the wall. In Daniel chapter 5, verse number 25, uh, and this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persian. So in Tekel, when he talks about the, the definition of Tekel, he says, thou art weighed in the balances and, and art found weighed, uh, wanting. Uh, you were weighed upon the scale. And God said, this is the measure you should be, and you are found what you didn't amount up to the measure. You are found wanting, and so God's, God's judgment's fallen. And that's the message that was being delivered in that day. But he uses that, that, that terminology, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. So sometimes balances are used to weigh, thing, weigh things of precious value, gold, silver, on occasion, judgment. That's the picture there, God's weighing that judgment. But grain products like wheat and barley, they're not normally sold by the ounce. You never hear about them being sold by the ounce. And they're not normally sold by the pound. They're sold by the bushel. You buy bushels of wheat. You buy bushels of barley. Or you buy baskets full in, in that culture in those days. They didn't buy it. They didn't pay for it by the ounce nor by the pound. They bought bushels or baskets. But during the tribulation, the famine will be so horrible that men... Uh, will sell the wheat and barley as a precious commodity. They will be precious because people will be starving to death. And they will be measured by ounces and by pounds, not by bushels, not by baskets, but measured by pounds and by ounces during the tribulation. They'll be considered precious. The Bible says there also, a wheat, in, in that verse number 6 there of uh, Revelation 6, says a, wheat, a, a measure of wheat, for a penny, I mentioned this on Wednesday night, a measure is one day's supply for one person. One measure will feed one person for one day. One measure, one person for one day. If you've got a family of six, and you have to imagine now, in Bible days they had very large families. It took large families to do the work around whatever your, your place was, to take care of your animals and livestock. It took large families. Um, you you kind of have to think about rural uh, America back, you know, in, in the 30s and 40s and 20s and even back in the 1800s. It took large families to take care of the farm. And this was the case in Bible days. It took large families. If you got a family of six, you need six measures just to keep people alive every day. One measure fed one person for one day. One penny was a day's wages. Matthew chapter 20, verse number 1. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. That's the typical wage. That is the wage. One day's wages is a penny a day. So a measure is one day's supply for one person. A penny is one day's wages. What they're selling is one day to keep you alive, one day's worth of food to keep you alive for one full day's wages. That was the deal. That was the offer, or will be the offer during the tribulation. Then he said three measures of barley for a penny. Now, barley has always been cheaper than wheat, but during the tribulation, 
it's even cheaper than normal. Evidently, wheat is more of a valued commodity than barley is because there's a better deal during the tribulation than there is normally uh, in comparison with barley and wheat. And that suggests that maybe something has affected the wheat crop. We know there are going to be pestilences. I mentioned this on Wednesday. We know there are going to be pestilences in that day during the tribulation. Maybe one of those pestilences has hit the wheat crop, but the barley crop was untouched. Uh, God's still merciful. Even when his judgment's outpoured, God's still merciful. God will still leave a few handfuls on purpose. And maybe that was the case. God let the pestilence hit the wheat, maybe, and, and he didn't let it hit the barley as hard. And so what you can find out, the ratio wheat to barley in the tribulation is three to one. But normally, the ratio is two to one. Two to one. You can get two measures of barley for what you would get one measure of wheat. Wheat's always been a more expensive uh, value than barley. Uh, and in the Bible, that we have that rec recorded in 2 Kings chapter 17, um, and I'm sorry, not 2 Kings 17, 2 Kings uh, chapter 7 and verse number 1. 2 Kings 7 1, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall I a measure of fine flour, that's ground wheat, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Uh, just turn the page, verse 16. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians, so a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of the Lord. Verse 18, it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel. This uh, shall be tomorrow, about this time, in the gate of Samaria. So the measure in Bible days, in Bible times, was two measures of barley, for the same price as one measure of wheat. But in the tribulation, Revelation chapter 6, it's going to be three measures of barley to one measure of wheat, which suggests something may have stricken the wheat crop and caused it to be a higher price than normal. Because you can get now three measures of barley for what you can get one measure of wheat. But normally it was two to one ratio. And then he says, and this will be the last thing I'll deal with, then he says, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Oil and wine are seen as luxuries. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. You love wine and oil, you're going to go broke quick. That's what he's saying. Those are luxury items. You're going to go broke quick if you love wine and oil. Those are items of wealthy enjoy. Those are luxury items. The poor will not be able to access the expensive commodities like oil and wine. But the wealthy will be able to get it from commercial Babylon. That's where they'll get it from, commercial Babylon. And uh, they'll enjoy that, and, and, as many do today. I mean, everybody can't afford a Tesla. But the wealthy have no problem affording a Tesla. Everybody can't afford you know, a Bentley, but the wealthy have no problem affording a Bentley. Uh, and the oil and wine during the tribulation are going to be seen as luxuries. And everybody won't be able to afford the oil and wine. Many people just barely be hanging on to getting that measure of wheat or, the, or those three measures of barley during the tribulation. Many people. Uh, but the wealthy will still be able to get the oil and the wine. They'll still be able to get it until... Until God destroys commercial Babylon. Commercial Babylon is one providing it for them. And they'll be happy with them until God destroys them. Revelation chapter 18, verse number 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. And the, and the earth was lighted, uh, lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. So he's talking about the kings of the earth, the leadership, and the merchants that are rich. They've enjoyed commercial Babylon up to that point in time. But now she's fallen. Verse number 9. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. 
standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that great city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. For no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen. He's going to mention all these precious things here now. Listen, pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine thine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of the most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and wine and oil and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. They're going to weep bitterly. Verse 15, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, and purple, and scarlet, and decked with gold, and precious stones, and pearls. They're going to weep. Because they have been enjoying the finer things, the luxuries, the oil and the wine. And that's what Revelation 6 is talking about. Uh, it, that third seal. Uh, hurt not the oil and the wine. Hurt not the oil and the wine. Uh, the, the poor won't have access to it, but the wealthy will still be able to get access to it. But don't hurt it because God's going to stop that. God's going to hurt that, that industry. God himself, when he brings down commercial Babylon... And the rich men of the world are going to weep and wail when it takes place. The third seal will not cause much suffering among the wealthy. Uh, that third seal, it, it's, he's not going to hurt the oil and the wine during the third seal. It's not hurt. They'll be able to buy and sell that, that, those luxury items. The wealthy aren't touched. by Up to that point in time, the wealthy really aren't touched much um, by, by the third seal. The violence in the second seal, that, that would affect them. But as far as the third seal itself, that famine, it's not going to affect the wealthy a whole lot. They'll be able to get these things still. But by the time they get to that sixth seal, things are going to change for them. Revelation chapter 6, last, verse, or last passage I'll read, Revelation 6, 12. Now beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Listen now, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? That sixth seal is going to affect them. The third seal won't affect the wealthy, won't affect the rich, won't affect the kings, the leadership, the privilege, not going to affect them. But by the time that sixth seal comes in, that sixth seal, they're going to be begging God to have the rocks fall on, take them out of this world. All these things are going to be unleashed. They're going to be unleashed upon this world. The first four seals, we believe, are quickly at the first, at the first of the tribulation. As it opens up, boom, 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 just four, real quick. And it's going to extend all the way through the seven years of tribulation. But by the time the sixth seal gets here, Everybody, if, if, if any of the other workings of the first five have not affected you, and if, if you're not saved, you're not professing the name in Christ, and that fifth seal, uh, you're martyred or persecuted greatly because of that. If, if none of the other things have hit you, if you've been privileged, by the time the sixth seal gets here, you're going to get hit. Everybody will be affected by the time the sixth seal gets there. Father, thank you, Lord, for your study tonight. Pray that, Lord God, you'd help us, Lord, to learn of thee so that we might have a greater burden for souls and a greater desire to see Christ magnified in this day. We're not living in the tribulation right now. Thank the Lord. We're not there right now. And, and, and if we're saved by the grace of God, we won't have to go through it. Thank you, God, that you've not appointed us to wrath. We bless your name because we're not worthy to be spared of it. You're just good to us. We love you and we thank you for saving us. And God, thank you for delivering us from that wrath to come. But I pray, God, for those that don't know you. Lord, they're going to go through it. If the rapture took place, uh, were to take place right now, and God, shortly thereafter, if the tribulation were to begin its seven-year period, God, they'd go through just literal hell on earth. 
I pray for them, God, that you'd save them, open their blinded eyes, burden our heart, God, and our souls, Lord, for their, for their souls. Help us to recognize, Lord, if they don't get saved, they're going to go through a horrible, horrible time, a horrible time. And then, God, they'll face the torment of hell if they, if they don't ever get saved. Lord, burden our hearts. Help, God, let this picture of what you show us in, in the book of Revelation, the chronology of the end times, let it be real to us. I pray that the Holy Ghost would make it real to us. God, give us, uh, give us a, a, a spiritual vision in our soul to recognize these things are real. And they're going to take place. Help us, God, to recognize that and have a burden for lost men's souls. Bless us, Lord, we pray this week. Keep us, Lord, safe. Help us to be a testimony for thee. Lord, thank you for your protecting hand. God, I recognize and realize, Lord, if you removed your prote hand of protection from us, America would fall in just a moment. The hand of the devil, God. We, we'd have no match. We'd be no match for the devil. We'd have no, we'd have no chance, uh, Lord, Father God, against the wiles of the devil, if that were to take place. But thank you, God, for your protecting hand of mercy. I pray that you continue to protect us. And I pray, God, for Holy Ghost revival. I do, even in America. I, I still believe, God, we can turn back if people would be willing to do it. I pray for revival, God. Help the folks to heed the warnings of God. Turn back to you. Bless us, Lord, we pray now this week. Keep us safe. Use us, we pray, for your honor and your glory. And thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. You're dismissed tonight. Thank you for being here.